Uh, well, good morning, Family Church. If you have your Bibles, we open to Psalm chapter 11. This morning, just like last week, we are in another psalm written by David. And last week, we saw in Psalm chapter 4 how he was addressing people coming against him. They were slandering about him, attacking his character. And this week, uh, we are going to look at that there are now some people coming to kill him. So next time you think you have it bad, right, just remember David and reading through the Psalms and people attacking him, slandering him, and now trying to kill him. And so we're gonna go through Psalm chapter 11. We're gonna read through that and then pray and then jump in. In the Lord, I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. We pray with me this morning as we begin. God, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Christ who gave his life for us, went to the death and rose again to conquer sin and death. God, we pray for our country and so much going on in the world right now, and uh, just so much is in the air, but we know how the story ends. We've been given the end, and that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church, and so help us to have hope in that this morning and place our hope and faith continually, even in the small moments of life, in you and in your word. We pray for open ears and open hearts this morning to be encouraged by your word. It's in Christ's name we give this time. Amen. A couple of background uh, a little bit for this verse. Maybe it was from friends, maybe it was from the enemy, how he heard about this threat. But we see in verse 2 that the wicked were bending the bow. And so some of you may know this um, regarding bows, but my family is big into traditional archery. And when we go home, we have time to spend out in the country shooting these bows. And these are like the bows from the past. And when they're stored, they're kept unstrung. And so it actually looks just like a normal stick. There's no bend to it with a string attached to it to keep their strength. So right before you go to use a bow, you would put your foot on it and begin bending it and pull the string up until it it gets set into the little notch there. And you do that before you use it. And then to unstring it, you would do the same. And so this is kind of symbolic in the passage here that there was some type of immediacy happening because they were bending the bows, they were putting the string on the bow, they were fitting the arrow onto the string, and so there was some type of immediacy to this threat. It says it was going to come from a dark place he would not see. And so in verse 1, it can be kind of confusing because David is actually responding to the threat that we haven't yet read by the time you get to verses 2 and 3. And so we see David's response to these threats in Psalms 11.1. Verse A it says, in the Lord, I take refuge. So I want to read about the counsel being given here. The counsel David was being given was to flee like a bird to the mountain. Behold, the wicked bend the bow. They fitted the arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. And then he says this question, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Foundations are like a civil order, the pillars of normal society, the rules of law and justice. We can relate to some of this right now. If you watch the news and you watch things going on where it looks like society is breaking down. And so what should we do? How do we respond when the the once land of the law turns into the lawless land? And, And that's what That's the question being asked of David is, is are you going to stay as the foundations continue to crumble? And so David was being given fearful counsel. I know at times in my life, I've been given fearful counsel. And the problem with fearful counsel is sometimes when we're afraid and we're given fearful counsel, it actually looks like wisdom. It looks like something good. Uh, For example here, Somebody might be nervous or somebody comes and they share with them about marriage and they encourage them to to sign a prenuptial agreement before marriage 
And then they say, well, at least if you're not going to do that, you should at least keep your finances separate and your purchases separate and keep track of all the things you bought with your money, right? And better counsel would be, if you're that concerned about sharing your life and finances with somebody, you probably shouldn't be getting married to them in the first place, right? And so, but there's this counsel where if you're already a little bit worried, it looks like wisdom, I talked with Pastor Terry about this, and he said, we sometimes cloak fear as wisdom. He went on to say something like this, the prenup may seem wise, but in reality, it's actually the opposite of faith, which is fear. Another example that we see in our culture is you need to live with someone first before what? Before you get married. Why is that? There's a lot of answers. We're we're not going to get to it, but I know you've heard some of them, but to find out that you're compatible, right? Well, it's not called wisdom, it's called sin, and when you do that, when people do that, when you're talking with a friend or you see somebody beginning to go that direction, you need to warn them because they're setting a precedent in their marriage before they've even gone. They're setting themselves up for future failure because they're, they're already establishing that God's word is not the foundation of their marriage, their own desires are. And so they're going to get married before God and say, God, I commit to you that I'm going to love this person, but actually I'm loving myself beforehand. I'm not committing to you because we're going to sleep together beforehand. So they've already demonstrated before they even commit to God what they're willing to do. And so they've already destroyed a foundation that they're trying to lay in marriage, but they've already committed to destroy that foundation. It looks like wisdom, but it's actually fear-based. We must remember 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound, what church? Mind. That's something needed today, a sound mind. This was a counsel that David was being given. It was fear-based, run to the hills. Typically, the human response when we encounter situations like this is either to fight or what? Flight, right? Fight or flight, and depending on how you're wired or depending on the circumstances, when you might have normally ran away, but it regards your family or your children, you might now actually stay and fight, right? So we see in verse three, a question that's asked again and again and again through history. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is the kind of question like, well, things aren't like they used to be, right? Things are worse. They're getting worse It's not how it was in the old days. The problem begins with the question being asked because it's focused on something tangible. Where should I go? What should I do? But these are all the wrong questions for us to ask. David's response in verse one actually gives us an answer to a better question we can ask. David's faith, this is your first point this morning, was in a who, not a what or a where. When we begin focusing on a what or a where, we're missing the most important element, which is a who, and that who is God the Father, Jesus Christ, being in the midst of our lives, being in the midst of our circumstances. It's not what we have or we don't have or where we should go or where we should stay. It's who do we have in the midst of this as the source of our trust. David says, in the Lord, I take refuge. He hears the threats. He hears the counsel to run away. He rejects all of it. And he says, in the Lord, he is my refuge. So David chose faith over flight. David was unwilling to flee, but because of his faith in the Lord, he was willing to stay. But that also meant he was going to stay and fight. So his faith actually enabled him to stay and fight. So many of the Psalms were written by David, And Psalm 11 is also one with David. So I want to take a quick profile of David because as we see these threats against his life, we often think of David in the wrong context. I know I grew up in the church learning about David the wrong way. And so to begin, David was probably in 12 to 13 different wars throughout his lifetime. That's a lot of wars. I mean, that's a, couple of, that's a war every couple of years or back to back. And so he was a man of war. He was accustomed of war. He was probably battle hardened. And when we often see pictures of children and children's ministry, often not ours, but other children's ministry or children's ministry books often do a horrible picture of depicting David as a small little child, right? And we think, well, God can do big things through little people. 
That's kind of the picture that we see of David. But biblically speaking, there's specifically not scriptures that say that David was a small little man. In fact, all the descriptions we have of David talk about him being a mighty man of valor. We have descriptions of his brothers who were tall and strong. And we see where they were going to be anointing the next king. And they say, God looks at the heart, not not the stature of a person. That doesn't mean that David was small. It just means that God's looking at the heart. David could have been a large man and him still look at the heart. But it also, we see that he's the youngest. Well, that doesn't mean he was a little guy either. I'm the youngest of all my brothers and sisters, but I'm in fact the tallest. And so being the youngest doesn't mean you're the smallest. And so we have descriptions of David killing bears, lions during his time as a shepherd. We might think about the passage in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where Saul puts his armor on David. And we have often seen, or if you've seen Veggie Tales, right? The armor was too big. It was dragging to the ground. But in reality, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite that David using Saul's armor was in fact another evidence that he was not a small man, but a large man. Because in the scriptures, we also see Saul is depicted as a full head and shoulder above all the other men. So Saul was larger than everybody else, and he had special armor. And then we come to this passage with David and Goliath, and they're trying to outfit him for armor. And whose armor do they give him? Saul's. Why would they give a little guy the biggest set of armor on the battlefield? Probably because he was similar size to Saul. But often, I've heard it said that it was too big for him, when in fact, it's not probably true. We might think it was small because he didn't use the armor. Sometimes a picture, it's too big. But when you read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, he says, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. He doesn't say they're too large. He says he hasn't tested them. He's not used to them. Third, in the Old Testament, we see David wield Goliath's sword. And so the tip of Goliath's spear tip alone weighed 15 pounds. His sword would have been quite heavy as well. And David used this as his own personal sword. And so David was probably a man's man. You can picture David. So I'm sorry for all of you vertically challenged people who had David as your hero. You have to find another. But take heart, you still have Zacchaeus, right? Look to Zacchaeus. Look to Zacchaeus. All right, this is important regarding Psalm chapter 11 because even though he was a mighty man, right? Even though he had been through war and battles, even though he had defeated Goliath, he doesn't trust in his sword. He doesn't trust in his his chariots. He doesn't trust in his stature. He says, I trust in the Lord. So what does it look like for David to have faith and trust in the Lord instead of take flight? Well, we can look back, the same situation with David and Goliath. It was either flee or have faith in God. Because if you didn't have faith in God, you surely weren't going to fight Goliath, right? And so really the only option was stay out of the fight, run away, and that's the option everybody picked. I'll read in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Listen to how David fights, but it's through his faith. 1 Samuel 17 David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. This leads us to our next point. Faith can enable the Christian to fight battles they would naturally seek to avoid. Faith can enable the Christian to fight battles they would naturally seek to avoid. If you did not have faith, you would not be in certain battles you would have ran away. This was what everybody else was doing with Goliath. Because they did not have faith, they weren't in the fight. But David had faith, and therefore he said, put me in the fight, right? 
And so he doesn't just say, hey, this is the Lord's battle. I'm gonna sit on the sideline and watch. He says, this is the Lord's battle. Therefore, sign me up for battle. And notice, did David actually had to fight? Did he have to actually fight? Yes, he actually did something, right? And so he prepared, he gathered his weapons. He took what was most comfortable with him. And sometimes Christians diminish the effectiveness of David's tool to make their story grander by equating a slingshot to a spitball or something. But I think it kind of takes away that David actually was taking the weapon he was most effective with. He was taking that with him. He had spent time using this weapon and he was fighting through his faith in the Lord, but he actually had trained with it. He had put in work and time and effort. And so Like David in Psalms 11, we are called to stand firm in the faith. And what that means is sometimes fighting. And we're going to look at what that looks like for the Christian to fight. We are not to run away, even if it seems like the foundations have been destroyed. We are to stay and fight. Now, I want to clarify something. David had swords. He had spears, slings, chariots available to him. He didn't trust in those things. He said, in the Lord, I take refuge. The equivalent for that here in the U.S. would be our guns. I thought I'd get an amen there, right? It's like, you can't amen guns in church. But the equivalent for that here in the U.S. is in guns. And there's a lot of people who trust in their guns in the U.S. It's really the thought, in guns we trust. A lot of Americans have that kind of as their motto. And I'm a a gun guy. I grew up shooting. I'm not a pacifist. So to that end, I do believe God has created men not only to be providers for their family, but protectors and defenders of their family and others. And so I'm not talking about persecution here. I think there's a difference between defending the life of another and being willing to die for your faith. Those are two different things. So to care for others sometimes means caring for others in providing safety for them. But just like with David, our trust should not be in a weapon or a gun, but in the Lord. Proverbs 21, 31, which Matt already shared for us this morning, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. But notice there's a horse and it's made ready for battle. But the victory is with the Lord. And so there is this symbolic relationship where these two things are working together, where David had trained and he took weapons out on the field, but it was his faith that enabled him to fight. Which leads us to our next point this morning. We must fight with the appropriate tools in the appropriate settings to restore godly foundations. It's important for us to remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So to restore the foundations that are being destroyed, the tools to be used today are not guns and physical weapons, but often spiritual tools like prayer, preaching, teaching, reach people's minds using God's word. It's true there are some foundations that are crumbling, and are being destroyed, but nevertheless, they are still present in our society, and we should fight to restore them. We need to understand the mindset of man is often we think the foundations are destroyed long before they actually are. I mean, if we can remember what the foundation should be, and it's not, that means the foundation is actually still there. It's just not as strong as it once was. So we must continue to fight battles that need to be fought first in our home, in our church, in our community, in our county, in our state, and in our nation. I mentioned fighting battles in our church. We are called to be unified as a church. And so we need to bring about first these battles because if we get it wrong in the church, we're not going to be able to live it out and give it to the rest of the world. So I want to go through a couple examples in the church are battles that that must continue to be fought. Number one, defending the inerrancy of Scripture and the authority of Scripture. I want to ask us, is this the standard? Is this the standard that we have, or is this just suggestive? Does it not apply today because it was written so long ago? 
or because my circumstances are different than their circumstances. I mean, is God's word for today? Is it your authority? Or can you pick and choose when it's your authority? Another foundation under attack in the church today is the biblical view of men and women. Such a hot topic in the church. We preached on this in uh, 2017. We did a couple of sermons on the uniqueness and the giftedness and the differences, and that these are godly differences of men and women, and that's how God created them. And to blur the lines continually between the two are to lose the beauty of how God created men and women, both of equal value, but distinctly different. And so if you want that sermon, rather than preaching it all now, I'll just reference it. That was December 17th, 2017 in Genesis chapter 2, and it was uh, gender roles. So you can go look that up. Another issue in the church to fight for sanctity of life, the battle against abortion, doing that through the local church, through local town hall meetings, voting, and protest. I want to transition into the home, an area of the home, husbands leading, loving, gracefully, their families, leading your wife, leading your children. Husbands, we are not called to coast. It's not coming home from work and my day being done. It's I'm coming home from work and that part of my day is done, but now I'm to engage with my family, with my wife, with my kids. I'm to lead them. I'm to be an example to them. It's not just coasting, letting the mom or the wife do those things. It is that I'm involved in leading my home to be a godly home. Husbands, we must be leading our homes to be godly homes. Wives, are you seeking to make your home a godly home? Are you implementing ways to do that, seeking to love and care? Is it a, a place of prayer? Is your home a place of support and love? I want to remind us, this is just in the discussion regarding the foundations that are continually under attack by society, the foundations being destroyed in Psalms 11, and what we're to do in the midst of them. I'll talk about one other area that I felt I really had to talk about as things continue to go in a bad direction, and that's about raising children. And if you're a grandparent, I don't want you to tune out here, because just because you don't have kids in the home doesn't mean you don't have an effect on your grandchildren because you do. You have a voice in this. The natural thinking is my kids need an intellectual education and my kids need a spiritual education. And so public school is going to provide the intellectual education and the church is going to provide the spiritual education. And me as the parent are going to make sure they're here and make sure they're here. The problem with that is the Bible never gives us the ability just to to shirk off our responsibility as the parents and give it to everybody else. It says that responsibility to train up our children rests solely on your shoulders as the parents. And so the more we outsource the responsibility to others, the more we are losing that responsibility and giving away something that God said really is our responsibility. Just because we give it away doesn't mean that we're not going to be held accountable for what we've done in the life of these children. And so a parent who outsources their children's education to the school and outsources their child's spiritual education to the church is going to be less involved than the parent who takes full responsibility for the training of their child intellectually and spiritually. So parents, grandparents, I want to give you a couple of words of encouragement. The first is bad news, but it it should help us in the understanding. Being in the schools and being a student pastor for so many years, I think all of us are aware that schools are continually not getting better, but in many ways morally getting worse. And so curriculum choices, things that are being taught are continually going in a bad direction direction. That being said, there's also more available resources than ever before if you're a parent and want good information, you want good curriculum, you want good things for your children. And that would many times be in in an example of homeschooling or something that is a hybrid nature of that way. And so things are getting worse. There's more reasons than ever before to consider 
some other options than just sending them to the status quo of public school that has always been. This is a personal choice between you, your family, and the Lord, but there are few choices in your life as a parent and in the life of your children that will have more impact on your children than what they are being taught from ages 5 through 17. I mean, there are few other choices that are as big as this choice with them in their, these impressionable years. So I want to share a few practical applications that apply whether your child is in public school, whether they're homeschooled, or whether they're in a private school or some type of hybrid. Number one, I encourage you to take a step back and don't just assume with where you're at that that is where you have to be. Just because things are easiest or most practical doesn't mean that it's right. And so I encourage you to spend time in God's word, spend time in prayer, talking to other godly influences, people that you look up to and how they're raising their children and talk with them and really take a step back and evaluate and don't just go along with what culture is doing. Maybe it would require a change of life, maybe an income cut, but really weigh the options. Secondly, I want you to take a step back and ask the question, what is going to help my child fall more in love with Jesus Christ? What situation, what circumstance, what atmosphere is going to help my child love Jesus Christ more? And is that an option? Is that something I can do for them? Third, be present and active in what your children are learning. Who are they being influenced by? What are they learning? What are their assignments? What is their network of friends? This may be a lot of work to do, especially as you have more than one child, that you're learning this with all of these, but it's so vital for us. Number four, having a healthy home. In our children's ministry, we have family devotionals that go five days a week. They're available on the app. If you go to our kids page, you'll see at the bottom of that page what family devotional we're on for that week. And you can work and make your home a a place of family devotionals. You can have Bible study discussions throughout the week, making your home that godly home. It should be a place. It's not just that they learn at school, it's that they're learning at home, educationally and spiritually as well. Number five, leading your family to church, making sure that they're involved in a church life. I mean, right after today's sermon, going and having lunch with your family and asking your children if you have children or you have grandchildren or it's even with your spouse. I mean, all of us should be doing this is, what do you think about the sermon today? Maybe asking your children, your teenagers, asking your spouse, hey, what do you think are the foundations that are under attack today? And and stopping and listening. Maybe they have a different perspective of the foundations that they see under attack. Why do you think that is? Asking those types of questions, why do you think that foundation is under attack? Which way do you think it should be? Where do we get that from? You know, how do, what is the example? What is the bar set? What does the Bible teach about these things? We need to be drawing this out. We can have these conversations and making our family, after we leave church, having lunch discussions over these things are vitally important and it helps create a culture in which we live. So if you don't know where to start, Maybe you have kids all different ages. Between the elders, we have 12 children here. We would love to talk with you about any of these options that are available to you, but we must understand there is a battle in the church. There's a battle in the culture. There's a battle in the home. It may not be with swords and slings, but nevertheless, we are called to walk out this faith and to do it for the Lord using scripture that it may benefit our families, our communities, our churches, and our children. I mentioned earlier how these changes are brought about by prayer, by our words, by our actions, by our voices, and our votes. And so if we're going to stand firm in our faith and seek to battle to restore godly foundations that are being attacked, we must be trained for the battle. I know many of you are studying God's word. This is what we must understand. This is what we must know. The majority of our time should be spent in God's word, but I also encourage you to be reading God's word so as to be able to export it. This is not just for my own profit. This is so that it may profit others that I'm around. And when I begin reading God's word and thinking, how am I gonna use this? How am I gonna use what I'm learning in Psalm 11 
in the lives of others. I begin thinking of people and ways and ways how this applies. And so I encourage us as we study God's word to think through how we are going to use it, not just in our own life, of course that must be first, but also to encourage others. I want to keep working through the verses here, verses four through six. We see the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. It says of God, let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Wouldn't typically be the first verse you would look to 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 share in an evangelistic setting, would it? So encouraging to, to someone who is an unbeliever. We saw last week how David, even though he was against the people, they were coming and attacking his character, that David was giving them good counsel. And he was actually trying to call them to salvation, call them to the Lord. And so in these verses, we see God in his holy temple says he's going to test the righteous, but there's a distinction between the two people. It says his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. This word violence is the Hebrew word Hamas. How many of you have heard that word Hamas before, right? A lot of us have heard that word Hamas as the radical terror group. It's interesting that Hamas actually takes their name from the acronym, and we'll put that on screen here. So Hamas is actually an acronym for that big long thing that I'm not going to try to speak. Um, But what's interesting is that acronym, when it's spelled out, is actually the Hebrew word for violence. So I don't know if they intentionally picked it that way or not, but that's just the way that that worked out. In verse six, we see a further description of what God will do to the wicked. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur. A scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. We've all heard it said and probably said the phrase, I know I'm guilty of this as well, that God loves the sinner, but hates the what? Sin. We've heard this before. We've said this before. And when it's applying to us that we need to hate the sin but love the sinner, that is true. There's a part for us to love others even if they're sinners, right? That's a Christian life. But in regards to how God acts, there's a majority portion of this that is not true. When, When this relates to the Lord, it is largely untrue. And I want to talk about why. In the scriptures, we never see a picture of man where it speaks of man as being generally good. And that's the issue with the statement is that it looks at the condition of man as being mostly good, except that he has a couple of sin issues. And so God loves all of it except for that and that and that. When in reality, the scriptures don't separate man and their sin. They just call man a what? A sinner. So it doesn't say he's a good man with a couple of sins. He just says it's a sinner. And so the Bible's condition of man is sinful from birth, born into sin, that he lives a sinful life. And so this this saying that God loves the sinner but hates the sin is really incompatible with the way the Bible speaks of God treating sin and treating people. Here's an example. There is not lies without a what? liar, right? And so there's no such thing as lies without a liar to perpetuate them. There is not rape without a rapist. There is not pedophilia without a pedophile. There is not murder without a murderer. And David finds comfort that God sees people's actions associated with them, and he's going to hold them accountable. When the Bible speaks about sin, it says liars, adulterers, blasphemers, idolaters, slanderers, false teachers. Notice the pattern. It's not a sin. It's a person living that way. This is horrific news because we are those people. But this is incredible news because when we see salvation, Jesus didn't just come to deal with sin. He came to save who? Sinners. Do you see this? And so the way the Bible describes your sin issue, it's you. He also describes your salvation issue. He came for you, not just to deal with that sin. This is why 
when somebody turns to Jesus Christ, they deny all of themselves and take up their cross and follow him. This is the way Jesus always talked about radical commitment to him. This is why in baptism, we are buried with our old self and raised to walk in newness of life. It's not that we just put off 10% of our old self, kept the 90%, and now we're good with Jesus. It's all of it. So we reject all of who we are, all of liars, adulterers, blasphemers, idolaters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, listen to this description of these sins, right? Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So was that a list of sins or was that a list of people? It's really both, right? It's a list of sins, but it's a list of people who are living that way. And he says, and such were some of you. So there were people in the New Testament church that were formally practicing homosexuals and they came to Christ and they put off their old manner of life. They put off that they were greedy. They put off that they were a drunkard. They gave up sexual immorality. It wasn't just a little thing in their life. It was a big thing. So Jesus didn't die for good people. He died for people who are willing to die in their sins, to turn over their whole life and give them to Christ. He said, I came for the tax collector, the sinner, and the prostitute. These are whole of people. Jesus never said, I came for the good person who struggles with greed. He didn't say, I came for the good person who struggles with a sexual addiction. He said, I came for the prostitute. Jesus didn't come for the good person who just struggles a little bit with alcoholism. He said, I came for the drunkard. And so this is you understanding, this is who I am. And Christ is willing to forgive all of who I am, not just a little bit. And so rejecting all of self, Jesus said, I came for those who are sick, not those who think they are healthy. In Psalm 11, we see that the Lord God, his soul, It says his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. This should bring comfort to us, but it should also bring an unsettledness to us that there are people living in their sins who don't have the gospel. They don't have Christ. Maybe there's someone here this morning or listening online. You see your life fit into one of these patterns. And it's not just something you do. You realize the whole of you is a sinner because you can't come to Christ as a good person. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us in this while we were still good people who sinned. No, it says sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if you don't consider yourself a whole of a sinner, Romans 5, 8 doesn't apply to you. There's no salvation available to good people. He gave himself for broken people who were sinners. And so the gospel, it's not about loving good people who sin. It's about Christ giving his life for people who have utterly nothing to offer God but their sinful state of themselves. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, that is your confession that there was nothing good in me but everything good in Christ. So if you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Christ. In that message of your brokenness and his forgiveness, this morning you can turn to know Christ as Lord and Savior. You can give your life to him. You can be made right with God. If you have questions or you have a desire to do that, you want to make sure that you are right with God, I encourage you to find me or find somebody else in the church you know is a believer in Jesus Christ and ask them to help you know that you are right with God this morning. We move to verse 7, the last verse here. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. We see this difference where his soul hates and then we see how he loves righteousness. We don't have righteousness except the righteousness given to us by Jesus Christ. 
And so that's why one day when we stand before him, we can give him back the crown that he gave us is because it's all from him and to him and for him. And so in summary, church, what must the righteous do when it seems like the foundation has been destroyed? The righteous must continue to stand against the societies of evil. And the one thing we must never do is run away and flee to the mountains. We are called to stand firm in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, even if trials and persecutions come. This is the message throughout all of the church is that the gates of hell would not pervade against Christ's church. And so even if the foundations get destroyed, we see the, the blood of the martyrs are the seed that plants the next churches. It's that what we are willing to die for is the gospel of Jesus Christ, standing firm. So may we pray often, may we study diligently, may we memorize God's word, learn continuously, and make it a practice of standing firm in the word of God, standing on the foundation, and putting our trust and our hope in the never-changing God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you that our foundation never changes. Even when it looks like around us, the foundation of the world is changing all the time. It looks like the foundations, the pillars of our society that we find comfort in, law and order, that those are changing and it helps reveal in us that maybe I look so often to things that are not my foundation. If we woke up tomorrow, and I I know it's all political right now, but if we woke up tomorrow and, and our world had suddenly changed and the pillars of society had changed and the things that once brought us comfort had changed, where would we be in our faith with you? May you continue to strengthen us. Help us not to look to what or to where, but look to who. That being you, Jesus Christ, as our foundation. We thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus Christ, for what you've done in our life. You have set us free. We see our broken, sinful state, but you have given us eternal life through your life, your, dar- uh, your burial, and your resurrection. So God, we, we thank you so much for Christ, for that we can worship you this morning. Help us to stand firm in our homes and in our church. And for other churches who preach Christ, may you strengthen them as well. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.